Welcome to The Buzz. I'm Christopher Conover. This week, efforts to turn a Southern Arizona National Monument into a national park. A bill to change Chiricahua National Monument in Cochise County into a national park is working its way through Congress. It passed a U.S. Senate committee on unanimous consent in May. It still needs a vote by the full chamber, however. In the U.S. House, an identical proposal is still awaiting committee assignments in that chamber. If the bill makes its way through both the House and Senate and is signed by the President, Chiricahua would join Grand Canyon, Saguaro, and Petrified Forest with the National Park designation in Arizona. To start our show today, we talked with Senator Mark Kelly about the bill he co-sponsored with the state's other senator, Kirsten Sinema. I started by asking him why the push to change Chiricahua's designation. I think for folks who have visited the Chiricahua National Monument, it's pretty evident. I mean, this is a natural wonder. It is very unique, um, not only unique to Arizona, but unique to our country. There's very you know, few places that have this kind of geology, and a lot of folks visit it. The idea here is to make a fourth national park in the state of Arizona. It's going to create jobs in the region. It's going to result in uh, more tourists coming to the state and specifically to southeast Arizona. Um, So this is a win for everybody, and it's uh, supported by a wide range of local government and tourism organizations. One of the arguments in favor of is national parks bring more tourists. Is that something that you've seen in your research that is kind of backed up by the numbers that once it goes to national park, more people find out about it and want to come see it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, there there are millions of folks across the country that visit national parks every year. Um, a lot of those folks, you know, they look for new parks to go to. And uh, this will be a new one. Chiricahua National Monument in 2020 got about, I think the number was about 45,000 visitors. In 2022, it went up to about 60,000, which is a lot of folks. I don't think it's a all-time high for Chiricahua, but we would expect more to come because this is a park. It's in a beautiful area of Cochise County, as you and I well both know, but the road out to Chiricahua, it's not a big road. If we're getting more visitors, that road might have to be expanded. Is there money in the bill, or does the Park Service help with that to expand roads, infrastructure to handle more people, or is that going to end up on Cochise County or the state? Well, I mean, uh, we'll have to you know, examine what the what the needs are. We passed this rather large uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill last Congress. So there is money available for infrastructure projects. Uh, they've got to compete for the funding. There's often state match funds required, uh, but this could get into, you know, that process or a number of other ways to improve uh, in- infrastructure out to the park. You're right. You know, it's probably not up to uh, what, it, what it would need if it got a dramatic number of visitors, but we'll see, probably see an increase. And then if there's a uh, need, that's something we, we can work on. This isn't the first time that the Southern Arizona delegation, the Arizona delegation, has tried to get Chiricahua National Monument turned into a national park. You've even tried before, but this time it feels like it's got some traction. What's different? Well, uh, I was able to get it through the committee in the Senate much sooner, like at the beginning of the Congress. So we have more time for the rest of the process. The, you know, the Republican controlled House having bipartisan support. It seems like we'll, we'll get it through the committee. We can get it onto the floor, get it voted on. So the, the, the path is clearer. And on top of that, we have more time to get it done. Uh, at the end of each Congress, it's like you got to start all, you got to start all over again. Uh, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me that we actually we actually do that, um, but that's the way the you know current process works. Um, in my two and a half years in the in the United States Senate, you know my observation is you know the the rules are um, they can be challenging at times. Things take longer than they should. It's not always in the best interest of the American people for that to be the case. And, you know I often think that if my former job at NASA if NASA had the rules of the United States Senate, the rocket ship would probably never leave, leave the launch pad. 
there may be those who look at the economics of this and say, wait a minute, those mountains have been historically mined. They're not being mined right now. But there are a lot of new mines coming into southern Arizona as we look for rare earth metals to help us go green for electric vehicles and things like that. And this could tie that up and make it more difficult. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we're a mining state. Copper and other minerals are incredibly important to our economy. They're also really important to the country. And if we're going to transition to a green energy economy, especially in transportation, we have to have access to these minerals. Yesterday, I was with uh, the Secretary of Energy, and we visited a company called Lifecycle. And what Lifecycle does is they recycle batteries. You know, they, they, they break up the batteries. They then take it down to its constituent parts, and they resell those. The, the CEO of the company calls it urban mining. Um, that can be and will, will continue to be a growing part of the mineral supply in our country. You know, at the same time, we're going to continue to need, we'll have a need to mine, you know, things like copper, cobalt, nickel. Uh, but there are certain areas, you know, Grand Canyon, you know, Saguaro National Park, Petrified Forest, and now soon, hopefully, Chiricahua National Park instead of National Monument that are so unique. I, I think they deserve uh, and should have an extra level of protection. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Chris, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. That was U.S. Senator Mark Kelly, a co-sponsor of the legislation to upgrade the status of Chiricahua National Monument. The sponsor of the identical Chiricahua bill in the House is Representative Juan Siscamani, whose district includes the Chiricahua National Monument. I started our conversation by asking him why he thinks the bill could make it through this time as compared to two previous efforts. Well, I'm not sure why it didn't get through last time. I can only talk about the efforts that were uh, at this this time. And, of course, we have bipartisan support on this, bicameral support as well. So I, I actually feel very optimistic that we can get this through. This is a divided Congress that we're dealing with, of course, the House being Republican, the Senate being Democrat, and obviously the White House also being Democrat, bills that can get through are going to have to have bipartisan support. And this one does, and it really should. This is this is one of those bills that just makes sense. Uh, you may look at this and say, gosh, why, why hasn't this been done before? Like you said, here, here we have a, a great shot at this. It's going to definitely help with tourism, and making this a national park is something that we heard from constituents in Cochise County that they wanted. I'm really looking forward to working with um, with the Senate on this and get, getting it through. For people who live here or spend time, want to come and see the Chiricahuas, what's the difference? Will anybody notice a difference between the National Monument and the National Park, or is it more behind-the-scenes stuff? Well, it's a little bit of both, but it's also the, the main aspect of it is the promotion, it, the, the list that it's going to be on, the tourism that it's going to attract. There will be 64 national parks with this one included in the country. So it's a very exclusive list of uh, attractions. Like I mentioned, the Saguaro National Park, of course, the Grand Canyon. These are just they, they, they are in this list that uh, tourists check out. They look at when they, we have world travelers. When they come and visit a state, these are one of the things that people look for when national parks are in the state. So it's it's really uh, what will be used for the attraction. This will directly impact the local economy as well with uh, with tourism, with restaurants, with shopping, retail, transportation. You name it. It's gonna it's gonna really uh, shape up to be something nice. A lot of people already enjoy the uh, the Chiricahua as a as a national monument, but when we call it a park, then it just changes the designation and and all that goes with it. Part of that designation change, assuming it goes through, deals with economic activities like mining in that area. Now, the Chiricahuas haven't been mined since the 1980s, but any concerns about cutting off that type of economic activity in the area? I haven't heard concerns on that. The local leaders in Cochise County have long sought to, for this change in Chiricahua to the National Park because they've determined that it would lead to a boost in tourism and and. When you look at what's driving uh, a big part of the economy in Cochise County, it is that. It's from Tombstone to Douglas, 
with uh, the cross-border tourism that we see there to um, Sierra Vista, which is the key city, the, the largest city in, in Cochise. I mean, the tourism is a big driver for the economy for Cochise County and, and for Arizona overall, because you got to remember that Arizona offers so many beautiful sites. You can get hiking and you can get um, ranges and you can get cycling, and you can get golf and you can get all kinds of things in just one state, which is mostly all within one day's driving driving distance. And, uh, and I got to say, even if it's a, a beach, you can go to a Rocky Point, which is only an hour away from the border here into Mexico. So really Arizona offers a whole bunch of attractions. And this is just this add, adds on to that. So, yeah, tourism is a big factor in the driver of this. You mentioned earlier when we were talking that this is a bipartisan, bicameral effort. You are the primary sponsor in the House. How did you get involved with Senator Kelly, who's one of the primary sponsors in the Senate on this, and a Democrat? Well, I think that just shows the willingness that both sides have at at moments to work with each other. This is something that we were able to find common ground on. We're not going to agree on everything, and that's, that's clear. And that's that's obvious for a lot of reasons we are going to have and we do have our disagreements in a variety of areas. This, however, is one that we can find common ground in. And this is also with Senator Kelly, but also Senator Sinema. So you have a Democrat, an independent and a Republican working on something that makes sense for southern Arizona. This is in Cochise County, which is in our district. And I was able to uh, get behind this, champion it, and be able to to fight in the House over here to get it through. And and I think it's got a really good shot at at making it out of out of the chambers here, and hopefully to the president's desk. You mentioned Senator Cinema. She is working on a bill with Congressman Grijalva to designate an area near the Grand Canyon as part of a national monument. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I I would have to see which one that is, but I think that. Whenever we can do what we can to preserve uh, our beautiful landscape while also promoting and allowing economic development, I I think that could be a win-win, but I would have to look at what area that is specifically. All right. Well, thanks for spending some time with us, Congressman. You got it, Christopher, any time. Thank you for for the time. I always enjoy talking to you, especially when I'm up here in D.C. and reporting back uh, what's happening up here. Let's make sure we do this often. That was Juan Siscamani, who represents Arizona's 6th Congressional District in the U.S. House. You're listening to The Buzz. After the break, we head out to Chiricahua National Monument to learn more about the area. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Buzz. I'm Christopher Conover. This week, we're looking at efforts to change Chiricahua National Monument in southeastern Cochise County into a national park. We started the show with the bill's sponsors. Now we learn about Chiricahua itself. AZPM environmental reporter Katya Mendoza recently traveled to the National Monument to ask some people who work there what makes it so special. Katya, welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's start with where you were and what brought you there. 
Well, I traveled a couple of hours southeast to the Chiricahuas for the first time, actually, even as an Arizona native. The National Monument is known for its rhyolite rock pinnacles, better known as hoodoos, which are also found in Bryce Canyon National Park. These welded tufts, or geological rock formations, were formed over 27 million years ago by a cataclysmic volcanic eruption at the center of the park, which formed the 12-mile-wide Turkey Creek caldera. The Chiricahuas are also known as a sky island with quite the extraordinary biodiversity and is certified as an international dark sky park. So that all sounds amazing, but what is it that makes the Chiricahuas so extraordinary? Well, the Chiricahuas are like a crossroads for four major ecosystems where the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts, the Sierra Madres, and Rocky Mountains converge. The monument also has five world biomes or large areas of plant and animal groups such as desert, grasslands, chaparral, and deciduous and coniferous forests. It is also certified as a Class 1 airshed, so through the Clean Air Act, the area is to be preserved for not only clean air, but haze and visibility. I was talking with physical scientist for the Southeast Group of the National Park Service, Jessica Garcia, who helps monitor the air quality every week, in addition to well and spring water monitoring. When a lot of people think about the Chiricahuas, they think about those balanced rocks, those hoodoos you mentioned. Are they actually stable, or are we just waiting for those you know, big rocks to fall off those pointy points they're setting on? So Jessica said that the rocks are actually quite stable. So the hooters and the pinnacles are relatively stable, and they've been mechanically tested and are fairly sound. The balance rocks, although precarious looking, with these large rounded rocks on these smaller necks, are actually more stable than some of the columns. Along the roadways is another issue where we do have constant rock fall. So you took a hike with Jessica and some others. Why don't you walk us through the site? So I was lucky enough to be guided by a crew of National Park Service staff down the Echo Canyon Trail for a little over four mile hike. We started at a higher elevation of about 6,800 feet and slowly made our way down, walking through these magnificent rock pinnacles covered in lichens, which look like small plants made up of fungus and algae. They look like yellowy green paint that looks like moss. They even said they lichen the lichen. What else did you see? Honestly, a lot of vegetation. There are over a thousand plant species that grow within the boundaries of the monument. From point leaf, manzanita, oak, and juniper trees, pine trees, and cypress, ferns, there were even bursts of red and purple wildflowers that were dispersed throughout our hike. And we also came across two red, white, and black snakes. Look at that guy. And what kind of snake is that? It's a king snake? Black on yellow is a king snake. Red on black, friends of Jack, something like that. Red and, red and yellow, kill a fellow. Yeah, red, red and black, black. friend of Jack. We do have coral snakes in all of three of our parks, but they're rarer than I the king snakes. I did get to see one last week when I was hiking the trail. That, that was the first coral snake I've seen in the park. But they do exist. They just don't like us very much. Yeah. There's also a raven's nest. They get really upset every time I'm here. Mexican blue jays. <laughs> Unfortunately, nothing furry and friendly. We missed out on coatis, black bears, and the lone jaguar that roams throughout the mountains. But I will be back. Four miles down from 6,800 feet. Uh, this does not sound like the easiest hike in the world. Uh, how strenuous was it? I'd say we only faced one obstacle on the trek. Little creek bed tossings. Then we're gonna start our uphill. It's about a quarter mile up uphill. <gasps> Oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm awake now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just try to keep you on your toes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, we were walking by, and a tree, a little sapling, a cypress sapling, had fallen over, was encroaching into the trail, and as I walked past the top of the sapling, decided to fling back and hit our poor host, give her a nice wake up. So I decided I should probably cut it out. <laughs> I got a mouthful of what kind of plant? Cypress. Cypress. It's got a real nice smell to it. It is. It's quite fragrant. Yeah. Mm. 
we've talked about the geological history of the area. What's the human history? Well, to start, many of the trails, including parts of the one we were on, were created by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the 1930s, thanks to the New Deal. And before that, Buffalo soldiers were stationed near Bonita Canyon as part of the U.S. government's effort to capture the Chiricahuan, Apache, Medicine Man, and Rebel Geronimo. There's just so much history, both geologically and culturally speaking, which I think is really cool and speaks to the monument's unique personality. The monument itself is a designated wilderness area. So what that means is that there's specific criteria that trail maintenance has to follow in order to basically maintain the wilderness's integrity. I spoke with lead mason at Chiricahua, Carl Stetter, who we heard from earlier, and here's what he had to say about the CCC. But uh, a lot of the trails were started by the Ericsons and the Riggs who owned Farway Ranch, which is a, a house that you pass when you come in, it's an old ranch house. Lillian and Ed Riggs had started like this whole business, the, the dude ranch business and getting people through here. People would take uh, horse, horses up into the monument. And eventually when uh, the New Deal came down, the CCC uh, were a part of, you know, it was, a, it was a big push to get the CCC down here because, you know, it was the hiring and jobs. So when they did, they had this grandiose idea that this had become a monument. They were going to build this wonderful staging area and have this huge celebration and commemoration. And so over at Maasai, which is the end of the road here, there's a little coronation stand that they built out of rocks and everything. And, Made this huge party. Basically, I think 8,000 people showed up. They had a 400 foot grill that they dug out of the rock and <laughs> grilled 8,000 pounds of beef, I think. <clears throat> but the CCC was here from 1933 to 1937, I want to say, and built most of these trails. They're all originally built as horse trails, that's why you get real large, wide sections. But over the time, you know, 100 years, things degrade. So we get a little narrower parts here and there. So Carl mentioned the Riggs family. Who was that? Ed Riggs was a rancher and trail foreman for the CCC, who later became a huge advocate for the monument. Riggs actually designed many of the trails that exist within the park today, including the Echo Canyon Trail that I hiked. One of the features of the trail is called Wall Street. Don't fall. <laughs> which is a narrow corridor of rock walls. I mean, this wall alone is probably about 40 feet, just stacked up on top of itself and back stacked. And then this whole area, you know, they had to cut through. And so it, it was dubbed Wall Street for obvious reasons. It's just two canyon walls on either side, just kind of narrowing. And you can tell like they took a lot of time realizing that this was a, a fail point, right? This is, this is a spot where it would probably just wash away. So in places like throughout the park where it's really there, there are steep drop-offs, if the park becomes a national park, would there be reason to put rails here? I would say that would probably be something that the park looks at for sure. You know, there's moments where, you know, even even now when we get into our busy season where this area does become a little bit more crowded and if it becomes a national park and people do come in the way national parks tend to see, a, you know, visitorship, it would be something that they probably will consider, though, again, being wilderness and being uh, um, historic, it's you know something that you, it would be hard to just immediately say, OK, we're going to slap this up. It's going to have to go through a whole process to actually you know, put up rails or ropes or anything like that. Has anyone fallen down there? Not since I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> no, luckily, nobody has fallen down there yet. So what do the employees think about all this potential change from monument to national park? They were all in favor of it for good reason, I think. You know, this isn't the first time its designation has been proposed. It's received bipartisan support. It would become Arizona's fourth national park and 64th for the country. I mean, there's a reason that people want to visit beautiful places like this. Well, getting national park status becomes it gives you a little bit more uh, protections within the park service. So when you're a monument, it, it doesn't take an act of Congress to remove the monument status, but when you're a national park, it does. So it will give us a little bit better protections. This is all designated wilderness. So it emphasizes that point that this is a place to be protected. Um, other than that, not much will really change except for we'll get more people. You know, there's everybody that wants the 
the stamp of the National Park Service. You guys, NPR just had a story about a woman earlier this morning that became the oldest woman to get to all 64 national parks. And if it comes to National Park next year, she's gonna have to come here too. So <laughs> she'll be here among others. The way that the NPS staff described it was this hidden gem of a place that sees over 50,000 visitors a year. This designation has touted economic opportunity for Wilcox and the surrounding area, but I also think it's worth noting, considering the best way to protect places like this. What do you mean by that? I think it's important to consider what a national park designation entails. Some people wonder what the influx of people will look like and how the physical land will handle it. Because it's a designated wilderness site, there's absolutely no modern technologies allowed for maintenance. So you have people doing manual labor, cutting down dead trees using two-person cross-cut saws, chiseling rhyolite rocks for trail staircases, using pulleys to move debris, and things like that. There are a lot of people behind the scenes keeping this park as accessible and enjoyable for everyone. I think of them as the unsung heroes of not only this monument, but at other parks. For the most part, we're like the gnomes of the trail world, you know, or, you know, of, of trails. We, we, not many people will see us. I mean, when they do, they get really excited. You know, we, when they see us working on the trails, it, it kind of brings to light like what it takes. And for us being in designated wilderness, you know, we don't get to use the fun tools that like the CCC had, which were like pneumatic drills and all that. A lot of our stuff is, you know, back to just using our hands with uh, you know, chisels. And so I think people do get kind of surprised at like how much effort you, know, you come across two guys cross cutting a, saw, a tree out. You know, you really do see how much it takes for us to do it. So what's on the monument's agenda in the near future, especially as uh, those of us who live in southern Arizona, lower elevations are looking for somewhere of a higher elevation to get to during the summer? So many projects. Another thing that they shared with me that is worth mentioning is that because of its history and location, they confer with about 14 tribal nations regarding projects within the monument's boundaries. Like I said earlier, it has a long-standing history with Chiricahua Apaches, so park staff said that they try to keep an open dialogue with the tribes, including the White Mountain Apaches, regarding reenactments, trail management. We have many different projects, including um, putting out wildlife cameras to see what the different wildlife, where they are, species presence and absence, that kind of thing. Um, we also do a lot of erosion control. Um, as coming up the road, you could see we had a lot of rockfall areas, and so we kind of do stability for those areas with different methods of seeding and hydro seeding and stabilization, working closely with trails and maintenance. All right, Katya, thanks so much for uh, spending a day out in Chiricahua and bringing it back to us. Anytime. And that's the buzz for this week. Tune in next week as we check in with two economists to learn about economic conditions both nationwide and in the state. You can find all our episodes online at azpm.org and subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcast. Just search for The Buzz Arizona. We're also on the NPR app. Zach Ziegler is our producer with production help from Desiree Tucker. Our music is by Enter the Haggis. I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for listening. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.